The Ara Parcis or Parcis Augusti was built in the Campus Martius, the field of Mars, in ancient Rome between 13 and 9 BC to celebrate the return of Augustus Caesar from a campaign in the western provinces. Hence the altar of the peace of Augustus, as it is translated, is a peace based on victory in war. The interaction of the altar with the shadow of a nearby Egyptian obelisk on the date of Augustus's birthday, 23rd September, lends a kind of astrological sanction to the victory and associates with the Roman defeat of Antony and Cleopatra and therefore of Egypt by Octavian, the future Augustus. There's an element of Athenian classicism in the Augustan style, but as we saw earlier in the Pergamon, specifically the Temple of Athena, there's a model for the detailed scroll work in the Arapakis altar. Unlike the isometria of the Parthenon frieze, where the heads of all the participants in the Panathenaic procession are, are all at one level, in the Arapakis there's individuation, different planes of relief, and naturalistic grouping. As Donald Strong says in his monograph on Roman art, published by Yale, the Parthenon's idealism contrasts with the political realism of the Arapakis, whereas the procession in the former was a conflation of a series of annual events, the latter was a single historical future event, the procession consecrating the altar. This dichotomy explains why so many artists in the service of Greek city-states are remembered. Roman artists are forgotten in favour of their powerful patrons. The decoration on the outer walls of the altar are a mix of the symbolic and mythic on the one hand and the real and political on the other. The Lupercal and the Aeneid form two of the mythical sections. The Lupercal was a ceremony celebrating the Romulus and Remus founding myth, here with the shepherd that adopted them, Faustulus. The Aeneid was the myth turned into an epic poem by Virgil, talking of the arrival of Aeneas from Troy to found a city where he would find and sacrifice a white sow and thirty piglets, as prophesied. The East Front also contains timeless representations of abstract personifications of Rome and its native territory. This representation of Italia, or Tellus, the Earth Mother, or perhaps Peace, represents the features of the land which made it so fertile. The figures sitting on the swan and the sea monster may be the Ori, or the Seasons. As Peter Stewart puts it, unlike a message as clear as the documentary in Trajan's column, it's possible that the figure was more symbolic than representative. The North Side of the altar shows positions of political power of the Republic. But it features softening human elements, such as a child tugging at a toga to be picked up. The senators, lictors or bodyguards, the augures or omen readers, the quin decemviri who are priests, and the septemviri who are commissioners, and others. The south side represented the imperial family of Augustus itself. The Julian house, so-called as Octavian was the adopted son of Julius Caesar, uh, Augustus therefore assumed the surname of Caesar and it became a title from there on in. Julius Caesar's family claimed descent from Julius, son of Aeneas. There were four representations of a Caesar, a classical nude hero, conquering soldier, wearing an imperial toga, or a veiled priest. And that's what's seen here, even though it's in damaged form. The Flamen or Flamines were also priests of an archaic function. The rest of the south side shows members of the imperial family. And when you're thinking about the meaning of the Arapakis or Gostate, you have to remember that before Augustus and Julius, Rome had been a republic for many centuries. The altar then is less about the peace that its name celebrates, rather than the man who brought it, and to convince us of the legitimacy of his rule, 
based on that achievement. The altar itself within the walls was a place of sacrifice, and like the Parthenon frieze, shows the procession of the sacrificial animals.